Labdien! Latvijas noturjātā ir tāda tradīcija. Today, in the area of Latvia, we have a tradition when we address each other, we usually say long live notariate of Latvia and notaries of Latvia, and others and others uh, do answer three times, uh, long live, long live, long live. Latvia has the honor that we in Riga host this event, and there are um, Estonian, Lithuanian, Austrian, German, Senegalese, and Pol Polish notaries. And now I urge you uh, to repeat after me our, our slogan that we are going to uh, change a bit, and I hope Janis will uh, also show it on the screen, that at this moment I would like uh, you to answer long live European notaries. And all together, long live, long live, long live. I think we have to repeat it. Long live European notaries. Long live, long live, long live. Uh, so I present you today. So, two uh, romantic notes that are important for each and every one of us today. Uh, this year, the 14th of April, uh, the capital of a chapter of order of uh, presidents decided uh, that for the work, excellent work, to award uh, one of uh, European notaries practicing in Riga, Skydri, namely Skydri de Krumenja, to award Cross of Honor of fourth grade. So we all together, um, let's congratulate Ms. Skydri de Krumenja. Dear colleagues, I um, would like to say a big thank you for, um, also 
uh, for your kind words and for your support to receive uh, this cross of honor. And this cross of honor, of course, is not for me alone, because in the ceremony, the president of Latvia also mentioned that uh, the notariat of Latvia is the judicial organization of Latvia that is developing very, very well. And that's and to uh, you too. Thank you. Thank you. Also, today, uh, for today's uh, event, um, the seminar will be moderated by Ulla, who is well known to everyone in Latvia, and uh, now uh, she will be known to you too. And Ulla has birthday today by accident, so we congratulate her. So, long live European notaries. And now I give the uh, microphone to Ulla and uh, let's start today's work. Thank you so much. Thank you for your warm wishes. And I also congratulate you on this beautiful and blooming spring day. I am honored to be here today. And I want everyone to understand today how important is our common European and global strives towards better future. And it's very important for our everyday life. And let's all think about the fact that um, our knowledge and mutual understanding should become a common understanding and a common knowledge for the future work. And um, I am congratulating today you for this European cross on this cross-border uh, seminar, training seminar Europe for notaries, notaries for Europe. Um, it's the 14th, and this is the first of DG uh, justice uh, awarding one million for this seminar uh, to look through the regula on the EU regulation 650 uh, 2012 a new perspective on international succession in Europe and now for the opening remarks I will give the floor to two very honored guests from international organizations and the first um, I will give the floor to uh, Dr. Daniel Sedar Singor uh, who is the president of International Union of Notaries um, he is also a sworn notary in Senegal uh, from Dakar, the capital of Senegal. And please, the floor is yours, Mr. Daniel Sedar Sekor. Thank you very much. Distinguished uh, President of Council of Sworn Notaries, Mrs. Sandra Yakusenoka, distinguished notaries of the European Union from uh, Estonia, Lithuania, Austria, Germany, and uh, Poland, distinguished uh, professors, notabilities, and guests, Labdin, dear colleagues, it is with great pleasure that the International Union of Notaries accepted the invitation of the Latvia's Verinatu Notaru Padome to this 11 training uh, seminary on international successions in uh, Europe. Let me first tell you about the Union, the Romano-Germanic civil law system, before a few general appreciations about the European aspiration to harmonize successions matters. International Union of Notaries uh, with Latvian Notariat has been a member since 1995, includes today 86 countries on the five continents, namely 15 of the 19 of the G20 countries, 22 out of the 28 state members of the European Union, and three of the so-called BRIC, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, 
Uh, that is to say, two-thirds of the world population and over 60% of uh, global GDP. 86 notary members of UENR are 39 in Euro, 22 in America, 19 in Africa, 6 in Asia, and civil law notariat, which is often referred as Latin type, represents nearly 300,000 notaries all over the world, 2 million employees, and 400 million authentications each year. Notaries appointed and supervised by the state to whom public authority is delegated act in its name, under its control and disciplinary authority. Their special status of public officials and liberal professionals practicing privately allows them to act as a link between public and private spheres between state and citizens, thereby embodying this public-private partnership of which we all recognize benefits. Notariat is therefore an extraordinary repository of know-how to help pre-establish proof of rights and make them peacefully secure through the mediation of independent professionals servicing contract-based peace. The International Union of Represent uh, functions thanks to three main bodies. A General Assembly, gathering the 86 presidents of national chambers, and I'm happy to address to a few of them uh, present today. A General Council and a dozen of working committees in charge with technical and scientific matters. A steering committee of 28 members dealing with political issues. Our policy emphasizes three major priorities. The first one is training, and this is a good sample today, both initial and continuing. The second is that we must also preserve the trust of our customers and of governments. This explains this priority of ethical and professional behavior of notaries. The third is to underscore the social role of notaries and the added value they bring to citizens and the state. The International Union was created in 1948 and it was since then the, uh, the only existing international notarial network. The Council of Notariates of the European Union was then founded, becoming an additional and very useful tool representing notary profession in Europe and dealing with the European Union institutions. Even if state is still characterized by sovereignty, territoriality, and its nature as an abstraction, things are changing. And there is a clear trend that leads state to quit ownership of industries, often cut on welfare, and to seek mediation at the place of state tribunals. At a notarial level, we find a quest for autonomy that often means that individuals may somehow craft their own family, choosing between marriage, registered partnership, cohabitation, not to say about the liberty concerning marriage regimes and gender. This will lead to significant changes in the area of the international law of successions, and it justifies this harmonization and this Europe aspiration. As far as the European Succession EU Regulation 650-2012, adopted on August 4, uh, 2012, is concerned, its Article number 20 provides for its universal application and this will have major impact on national law when it will be applied on August 17th next year. Concerning the European Certificate of Successions, Article 64 of this EU regulation opens the door to an authority which under national law has competence to deal with matters of successions. This authority may well be a notary. This is to say that globalization has greatly enlarged the scope of notarial functions and that the rise of new economical powers, the increase of free trade, circulation of persons and goods, firm shopping and completion among legal systems 
have moved the axis of a word to the whole world. The fact that you are listening to a president coming from Africa is not happening by chance, but an expression of our global village. This leads me to express high appreciation about this European aspiration to harmonization and deep satisfaction about this notary's willingness to participate in this training seminar in order to create a common understanding of this EU regulation application. Would you please me allow to proudly magnify this Latvian Council of Small Notaries dedication as written in a letter that I received from Mrs. President Sandra Jakusenova on January 24th last. She wrote, call upon notaries to explain their role to the society, acknowledge the values of notariat by offering high quality notarial services and by being active members of civil society, exchange of best practices and experience, and by doing comparative research. End of citation. This seminary is a clear evidence of this very useful dedication. Obviously, the UENR is the international instrument to allow the notarial profession to be open and to actively communicate with foreign practice, wherever it may be, thus getting information about their legal system and trying to share experience and know-how. You can already use the contacts provided by the UENR and the CNUE organizations in order to get in touch with colleagues from other countries and to ask for help and necessary information immediately. <clears throat> this seminar has not only academical and educational meaning, but also a broad social consequence, which is a key element of establishing friendship and a strong cooperation network between notaries of different countries for solving daily work-related issues. And I can tell you this. Thanks to the fact that Council of Small Notaries of Latvia has generously organized this remarkable and very first seminar of this kind in the Northern Europe region. Ladies and gentlemen, let me thank you for your kind attention and warm hospitality, wishing that we'll tighten keep in touch through my person and our dedicated notaries organization. Thank you very much. Our guest has a present which he would like to award to the, the chairperson of the Latvian Notaries Council. As a tradition in the Union, anywhere we go, we have a small uh, souvenir about this passage and especially to recognize the dedication. And it is certainly the case of Mrs. Sandra Jakusenova. Representation of the Union. And this is a personal gift, the book that I wrote, which is for you. Thank you. The next speaker on the global as well as the European regional cooperation for notaries uh, will be the speaker, Secretary Generally of Council of the Notariates of the European Union, um, in other words, CNUA, um, Madame Clarisse Martin, and she is going to inform us about uh, the CNUA and its projects co-founded by the European Commission. Dear Mrs. Yakusinoka, President of the Chamber of Strong Notaries of Latvia, distinguished representative of the authorities, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to be invited uh, to your training seminar on succession law today as Secretary General of the Council of Notariat of the European Union. 
and to be able to speak to you from this podium in Riga. Please allow me, first of all, to congratulate you on the organization of this day, of this seminar, for the many participants present today. Some of you having come a long way to attend. A lot of countries are represented here, and we are very, very glad of that situation. This show a real desire to participate in this core border training process for the CNUE and over a year ago, step by step, day by day, we informed the notariats of to 20 uh, countries with a Latin civil notariat about recent European law legislations, particularly in relation to international succession and matrimonial property regimes. This new European legislation will have important consequences when settling any cross-border succession in our member states. It also provides for the creation of a European Certificate of Succession that will prove the capacity of hire in all the member states and will make the step hires have to take considerably easier. The regulation will be fully into force from August 2015. So notaries are have to be prepared to play a central role in applying this regulation and in particular in drawing up the European Certificates of Successions, just as notaries do already drafting inheritance certificates and act de notoriété. So, in practical terms, we have already begun training notaries in this new European legislation. With funding from the European Union, and fact, thanks for that. We have been running a vast training program since 2013, organizing 14 seminars, the aim being to train 2,000 European notaries before the end of 2014. So, we, we can have a look right now on um, a few words about the CNUE. Let me begin with a few words about the CNUE. We have been a group of presidents since 1976, but uh, for a long time we called the conference. And now we have created a legal status uh, named ASBL under Belgium law since 2003. And we began then the Council of Notariats since 2006. We have uh, 22 members. The Croatian Notariat joined us in July 2013. And very recently, we accept the Turkish Notariat as an observer since December 2000. You all know that the CNU. Um, is playing a very uh, important role in Europe. You can imagine that we are representing all the um, uh, 40,000 uh, notaries in the EU. So we are a political body and we are dealing with the European institution as a lobby. We are official, the official voice of the notarial profession and we are researches uh, and adopts a lot of common positions to defend them um, in front of the uh, EU bodies. So I think it's really important to know that uh, we have two main uh, actions. We are um, making some influence on the European legislations on one side, but on the other side, we have developed a lot of uh, co-partenariat, co co-partnership with the um, Commission. So it's really important to have these both aspects in mind. As you can see, uh, the Commission, the European Commission, has helped us understand why the European Notariat uh, decided to get involved in the European project, because it was so important to have this um, statement that so many European citizens are going through Europe. So, uh, 8 million Europeans live in the member states uh, over than owns, a lot of succession with an international dimension, 
a lot of couples international aspect in Europe, a lot of marriage per year, and all the registered partnerships and with an international element. So it was absolutely necessary for the notaries to organize themselves uh, to, to answer to all this uh, challenge. So it was a reason why it's, it was really important to um, make a lot of things. We organized ourselves <coughs> in working groups to, to work on a lot of subjects and to have a very big influence on the EU legislations. So how, how you can see, we have a lot of legal matters under control. We try to have under control and we, are, um, we have a very big implication of all the notariats. It's, uh, for instance, uh, the European contract law with a German president, Mr. Limer, or um, authentic instrument with a French presidency and so on. So you have all the example of all the work we are doing in a daily life at Brussels. But I think the most important thing for you is to know that we have developed a lot of tools uh, for the citizens, but of course for the notaries too. And please use them because they can be really useful for your practical day of life and practical uh, professional uh, work. So apart from our classical lobbying activities in Brussels, which seek to influence EU legislation, and the contraction. We have also und undertaken a series of co-partnerships with the European Commission in the recent years. I would like to mention these co-partnerships briefly today because they have many practical use for you as notaries when you are confronted with a foreign element in your daily practice. <coughs> the project is a chronological order was the European Network of Register of Wheels. <coughs> we began with an interconnection of registers of wheels between Belgium and France, and now this has now extended to 17 countries. As you see, it's really useful uh, to have a, a possibility to find a wheel abroad. So, Please use this system. It could be really, really important to have such a tool in possession. This is our website on succession. It contains fact sheets, detail on succession law, applicable in each EU country and responding to a number of practical questions. <clears throat> You could have a look on this website and it, it's really, really useful. Why? Because you could answer all these questions. Which is the competent authority? Who should I contact? Which law applies? Can I choose a law applicable to my succession? In the absence of a will, <coughs> who inherits and how much? And so on. So, uh, we have been more than one million visits in three years. So it's really useful for you when you are looking for a foreign law on succession. Please consult this website. It will be practical. Following the success of the succession uh, website in Europe, we undertook a second one, this time called Couples in Europe. The aim of the second project was to make information available to public, like the Successions website, but this time on the different matrimonial property regimes and registered partnerships in the EU country. It provides information on the law regulating matrimonial property regimes on, um, in covers, it covers uh, 27 member, member states, and it's available in 21 languages, so it could be couples in Europe. You can see all the languages and you have the possibility to access uh, to a foreign uh, law uh, abroad in a lot of languages, uh, in your languages and in a lot of um, particularly uh, information really useful on such um, questions. For instance, what law applies 
is there a statutory matrimonial property regimes and so on. So you can have a lot of answers to your question when you have a, a client from abroad. We finally, we recently uh, decided to create a, a last um, uh, website, the Vulnerable Adults website. It was really pleasant uh, to, um, yes, to have this uh, the same system and uh, to, to be able to give a lot of um, information about uh, the protection for adults. What protective solution do you can, you can uh, find under this uh, website? You can have a look on such a question too. So I think we, we could have the idea to, to um, um, have a possibility to have a new website for the um, minors too. So it's really, really useful because there we have this social role in that project. So then, <clears throat> I can say a word about the European Directive of Notaries. At the European Commission request, and under the patronage of the Slovenian Notariat, we also created a European Directory for Notaries. For each country, each town, it, it includes all the notaries of Europe, listing the contact details, location, and specifications, and when applicable, the languages they speak. It's a fantastic tool that provides many interesting for, for citizens in general and other possibilities by the CNUA. We just need to ensure the data is kept up to date. This is taken care by the uh, national chambers, of course. So you can, fi you can find, uh, you see, all the notaries in Europe, and it could be really useful if you want to find a notary uh, in Germany, for instance, who is speaking uh, French, or um, in uh, Italian, who is speaking uh, your language. So it's also a very useful tool in a lot of languages. You have this result, for instance, and you could have the localization and all the um, local details. Now I can say a word about the notarial network um, who has existed for a while. It enables notaries that uh, encounter a procedural difficulty regarding European legislation who are lacking certain knowledge to get help from one of the notarial national contact points. So it's a tool for notaries confronted with practical cross-border questions. You can ask your, your contact point and uh, uh, this contact point could be in relation with another contact point in Europe and it could be also very useful for your practical day. Then, the training, I think we, we know that this seminar today is really, really useful too because you can imagine that um, this training program in Europe for 2,000 notaries involved is a very, big, a very big success for us and it's a, a big recognition from the Commission on the role of the notaries. So we are very happy of that. And then, Last but not least, the EU Fides project, um, which could be really interesting too. It's the uh, possibility of facilitating the cross-border real estate transaction in Europe. Cooperation between two notaries working in different member states with an electronic platform. It could be an exchange of documents and documents uh, for facilitating the cross-border um, real estate transaction. So, this is all our project. If you want to find all these uh, tools, you can only remember that uh, you have the address Notaries of Europe and in the uh, first page you can find all the banners with all these projects. 
and uh, don't worry about the addresses because really it's really simple you can go on our website notaries of europe and find all these tools and uh, you can also have our electronic newsletter and a lot of conference and congress like like today and uh, i think it's uh, really important uh, to to know all these tools once again and in the name of the president of ECNUA, Mr. André Michelsens, let me congratulate you for proposing to participate actively in the training process for the notaries of Europe, specifically respecting the multicultural aspect of the seminars. Thank you for your attention, and I am absolutely sure that you enjoy the seminar. Thank you. Paldies, Martins Kundzei. Viņa ir līdera Eiropas Thank you, Ms. Martin. Uh, she is the leader of uh, uh, Council of Notaries of Europe since uh, its foundation, and she has been uh, uh, with the Council since the very beginning, and her experience would be very, very useful. So during the seminar, you might find it uh, necessary to ask her some questions and probably ask her in detail some uh, things or probably find out about her visions for the future of the organization, what has been already done, uh, what projects have been already outlined for the future, so you can prepare your questions for her. For uh, the next speaker, I would like to present you the notary from Riga, uh, a notary from uh, Latvia, Edward Svirko, who will give an overview of the regulation uh, 650. He is um, um, an author of several publications. He has studied in Germany and in Latvia. He loves music and he plays the piano, as her, his colleagues are telling me. So uh, the floor goes to Edwards, and there will be a presentation on uh, the screen, but all the presentation materials will be available um, on the web page. I don't know whether they will be uh, translated in all five languages, but the previous presentation and the next one uh, will be uh, translated. And Bia is nodding, so that means that, yes, all the presentations will be available in all five languages. So I give the floor to Edward Svirko, please. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I congratulate you today on uh, this very a you know, special event dedicated to uh, European successions or successions in Europe or the EU regulation uh, 650, a regulation of European Parliament and of the Council on Jurisdiction, Applicable Law, Recognition and Enforcement of Decisions and Acceptance of Enforcement of authentic instruments in matters of succession and on the uh, creation of a European Certificate of Successions, um, number 650 uh, from 2012, uh, also uh, widely known as Rome 4 regulation. This um, regulation was adopted on 4th of July 2012, and it was published in the official journey. Uh, on the 27th of July 2012, and it will be fully applicable as from the 17th of um, 16th of August 2015. But we will start application uh, of this regulation starting from uh, August 17. Uh, the regulation um, lays down uniform uh, conflict of law rules and jurisdiction in cross-border matters of succession in EU member states. It also defines regulatory framework for recognizing decisions and acceptance and enforcement of uh, authentic instruments in matters of succession and establishes a new cross-border document in European a European certi Certificate of Succession. Um, so, European Certificate of Succession that will uh, coexist uh, 
in parallel with national uh, legislation on succession. The regulations has um, 86 articles and 83 recitals recitals, uh, giving um, us a possibility to examine uh, the definitions or uh, how to interpret an article. Uh, so in the text of the regulation, there are many places where word notary is mentioned, which is uh, very pleasant for us, and it's very rare. Uh, because usually European uh, legislation has to be adopted in a uniform uh, manner throughout uh, Europe and it has to be reduced to a minimum, usually. But uh, not in all European uh, countries, uh, there are notaries. Uh, notaries exist as uh, public officials with public functions, executing uh, state powers in uh, legal matters. Uh, such notariat doesn't exist in Scandinavia, in British um, islands as well as uh, I have to mention that uh, Britain and Ireland and Denmark uh, were not participating uh, in this regulation and it's not binding for them. This regulation is not binding for them. As this regulation pays so much attention to a notary, it also shows how important for many countries it is to uh, stress the role of notaries uh, in succession matters. They don't only prepare documentation of successions uh, to be handed in uh, to, uh, for, to institutions, but they are institutions themselves uh, that can uh, rule on succession matters, matters by themselves. The peculiarities uh, of uh, the translation of the regulation in Latvian uh, is uh, very peculiar because uh, interpretation, the translation is very, very heavy, so to say, and very hard to interpret. It's very interesting uh, for us to, for example, observe that, uh, for example, an auth authenticated instrument or authentic instrument has become a legal act that has been registered as a public act, so a clumsy translation, so or a public or authentic instrument is a public act that has been uh, authenticated by an authority. So it's hard to imagine if uh, if an instrument that is already legally binding has to be authenticated. Uh, that's kind of an apostol, if I might say. So um, many, many places where we are lost in translation. So I would like to stress that uh, an authentic instrument uh, is an instrument that has been produced in a, league, in a certain way and that has significant power as it stands. Also, speaking about translation of the regulation where there are many places where um, legal texts or legal terms are left uh, in Latin, in rem, uh, inter vivos, les pendens, forum intensipatis. It's very, very good to um, uh, to, to remember my Latin professors. But what I want to say, I would like to recommend the same as I might say for um, all the regulations of European Union. So please take, before applying uh, the norm in Latvian, please, prepare, uh, pre, pre, please compare it to um, any other language version that you, you understand, English or French or whatever. So, and now, um, broad overview of the base questions. Why did the necessary 
the necessity uh, for establishing a uniform re regulatory framework occurred. The number of people who live abroad from this, uh, their citizenship countries or who live in several countries and locate their assets uh, there is continuously increasing. For this reason, the question becomes increasingly important in which country should matters of succession be reviewed and which national law should be applied. Up to now, the regulatory framework for determining the jurisdiction governing matters of succession and applicable law differed from one member state to another. The criteria also differ between the five countries that are represented here today. And according to my information, uh, the, in Estonia, if this, uh, it uh, defines the deceased person last habitual residence. Um, in Austria, it's the testator's citizenship. Also in Germany, in Latvia, it's location of property. Or in Lithuania, it's shared um, competencies of uh, person's domicile regarding movable property and location of immovable property. But in Latvia, it's very easy. It's Lex Rei, the location of property that determines the succession matters. Um, as far as I know, Latvia was the only country who applied uh, this principle and only this principle, namely Lex Rei. So uh, in Latvia, we understand it that uh, no uh, no institution, be it a, a bank or a land registry or another uh, institution, they do not accept, accept um, succession uh, certificate uh, from another country. So even if they do have this certificate, they have to start this uh, succession, uh, to, to look through these succession matters in Latvia again. Uh, disregarding whatever has been decided in another country. Uh, so in the case of uh, differing regulation between countries, such, such situations occur where various EU member state institutions have the jurisdiction to adopt decisions in the same matter of succession. And they may apply various regulatory framework. And uh, the regulation seeks to address the uh, mentioned problem. And now speaking about the scope of regulation, let's see um, Article 23, regulation as a whole, determining the applicable law of the regulation to the succession as a whole. The law applicable to matters of succession um, will regulate the cause of opening of the succession and the time and place, methods for determining beneficiaries and the shares to be allocated to, the, to them, the capacity to inherit liability for the testator's debts, reserved shares and other restrictions on the disposal of property, sharing out of uh, the estate and other matters. Uh, the regulation uh, um, uses the expression shall govern in particular, especially if uh, we look at uh, the 23rd article. But regulation also allows, uh, however, the regulation distinguishes the matters in which member states preserve the influence of the national law. For example, the regulation is not to be applied in the public law spheres, for example, of revenue, customs, or administrative matters. Succession regulation does not affect national laws also in such areas of law as family law, including the matrimonial property regimes. Rights in rem, handing over the property by any other means than succession, registration of property rights, and others. Um, uh, also, handling uh, over the property by other means than succession, um, as I said, and registration of property rights. 
um, in other ways. Um, speaking about um, the jurisdiction, in accordance with the key principles set forth in the regulation, the court of um, the member state uh, uh, where they the court of the member state uh, where the deceased person's habitual resident was has the general jurisdiction to rule. Um, if the deceased person uh, habitual resident at the moment of this was not in any of the member states, the regulation gives jurisdiction to rule on the succession as a whole to the court of the member state the property of the succession is located in. If the deceased person was a citizen of the member state at the moment of his or her death, or if the deceased person, person's form um, habitual residence had been in the particular member state, provided that less than five years have passed since leaving that member state. Moreover, uh, the primary uh, primary setup is the last habitual residence or uh, or uh, the country where the testator's property was located. In some cases, um, it might be the country or the regulation might apply to a member state where with which the testator had evidently closer links uh, to rule on this situation if for example uh, the deceased person's member state has no jurisdiction Speaking about applicable law, the aim of the regulation is uh, for the member state where the succession uh, the matter of succession is handled to apply its national law as well. However, it also lays down an opportunity for persons to determine the law applicable to their matters of succession by expressing its last, wi last will. It might be also um, the applicable law of a third country. But the applicable law must doubtlessly stem from the disposition of property. But persons may entrust to apply only the law of the country they were citizens of at the moment of choosing the applicable law or at the time of death. If a person has several citizenships, the choice might be made in favor of the law of any country of the citizenship, including the law of a third country. Uh, one must point out that the provision on the law of another country applicable to a matter of succession is related to the application of the sub substantive norms. Simultaneously, the handling process of a matter of succession takes place in accordance with the proce procedural norms of the particular member state. The only exception when an institution may decline to, to apply the law of another country determined is a disposition in a disposition of property is the situation when the application of the law in question um, is an obvious contradiction to the public order of the um, location country of the court. The regulation um, give, uh, forms also a new authentic instrument. Um, the certificate of succession, um, where it still there still might be situations in relation to matters of succession when a recognition of decisions in another member state might be of importance. For example, in a court order, if a court order settles a special dispute related to a matter of succession. Based on this recognition, uh, declination uh, to uh, uh, 
where uh, the decision might be in very uh, limited uh, limited uh, cases. For example, one of those uh, might be public uh, cases of public order. Uh, the regulation applies similar principles to authentic instruments, stating that an authentic instrument issued in one member state uh, must have the same evidentiary effect as in the member state of origin, or the most comparable effect, the mutual um, um, if, and um, uh, these authentic instruments can be contested only in the country of their where they are issued. The origin uh, can be questioned uh, only. Uh, in the member state, which is uh, which has issued uh, the uh, document, since the competent authority in matters of succession of several countries, questioning re uh, questions regarding the competence of notaries should be addressed separately. So. Um, the regulation uses an expression, a court of a member state. Some, in some places, a competent authority of a member state is used. So uh, the question is whether notaries do have binding obligations to find out who is responsible, uh, depending on whether they can be uh, whether an expression a court can be applied to notaries. As it's apparent from recitals 20 and 21 of the regulation, the term court uh, must be given a broader meaning, In, not only to understand courts, but also to understand notaries and other institutions executing functions of courts. The regulations divide two cases or separate two cases when uh, notaries do equal courts, that's why they have binding, uh, they, um, they have binding obligations towards this regulation. And they have to recognize um, uh, the provisions of um, the regulation or uh, notaries do not exercise judicial functions and provisions on jurisdiction are not binding to them and public circulation of the instruments issued by them takes uh, place in accordance with the provisions of authentic on authentic instruments. Until 2003, uh, succession matters were handled by courts. Uh, and since 2003, it's done by notaries. So, uh, with the notary is a court or executing court's functions, um, it's not yet decided by a law. It's not determined by a law in Latvia, so uh, the discussions do go on. That's why the question about um, application of the regulation to the notaries of Latvia is still remains a question for um, um, institutions to decide. Thank you. Thank you, Edward, for your interesting statement. And I feel that uh, both Edward as well as uh, others uh, are authors of publications, articles, and books. So you will have so many things to write about and analyze. So this will be a wonderful opportunity for you to give ideas and comments to each other. Now, as for the next speaker, I am very honored to announce to Christoph Dorso from Germany. Bonn. Uh, to give the floor to him, he's a notary in Bonn. He uh, was in Riga in 2001 and 2003, uh, two, uh, within the, the scope of the cooperation with the German uh, Bund uh, and uh, the Latvian Ministry of Justice. He also delivers lectures at the University of Bonn. And I would like to give the floor now to Christoph, who is going to talk about the European Certificate of Succession. Thank 
Vielen Dank für die freundliche Begrüßung, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren. Ich freue mich heute hier in Riga. Thank you for uh, the very nice welcome address. I am truly glad that I can deliver my speech to you today. However, I think that the time dedicated to my presentation in accordance house, uh, with the program has already lapsed. This new European Certificate of Successions becomes effective simultaneously with the regulation. It is um, provided to regulate the succession matters which have cross-border elements. And the authorities responsible for handling these matters will be notaries. And this is a good reason for introducing you to this um, topical matter. In accordance with the Article 63, the Certificate of Succession, should be used in relation to the testee or to the inheritor. And this European Certificate of Succession will be of practical applicability, especially in cases when people cannot refer to a certificate of succession issued by one member state and not recognized in another. And you know, this will not be a, a rare case because in quite a few member states, such as um, certain countries, there are member states which do not recognize a certificate of a successions. For example, the certificates referred to as Erbschein in Germany. In order to apply the certificate of succession in practice, the regulation does not provide for harmonized requirements with regard to what these certificates must look like. The regulation includes only a couple of keywords, such as how to verify whether the issuing authority verifies the authenticity of the do of the instrument and who has the right who is entitled to use this certificate also the regulation includes norms regarding the introduction of amendments and changes and regarding the contestation of the certificate in a legal by illegal means as it was mentioned the lex re site is used as the foundational rights, the foundations one must base their activity on. The precondition for issuing the certificate is the international general jurisdiction. The Article 64 lays down the competency for issuing the certificate. Particularly, I am talking about the member state, the courts of which have jurisdiction in accordance with the 4th, 10th, 11th, and some other articles. Thus, the competent member state is the member state in which the deceased person had a habitual residence in at the time of death, or at least the permanent residence permit, and permit in it. In accordance with Article 64, this was the basic case, the, the basic matter for regarding the last habitual residence. Certainly, some exceptions apply as well. What is sought here is balance between the, the jurisdiction and the applicable law. Exceptions may occur if, in accordance with Article 4, the competent court 
considering the choice of law of the deceased person and announces him or herself incompetent, it announced, is announced incompetent in the matter, and therefore it results in the declination of jurisdiction, and thus the jurisdiction can be substantiated only in the case if it was evidenced with the will or the disposition of property. Well, certain other rare exceptions apply as well. I am not going to go in greater detail with those for now. Now, as for the issuing of the certificate of succession, such kind of a certificate can be requested by the executor of the will uh, or inheritors or the managers of the estate or the, or the, of the inheritance. One must uh, see, see whether member states are going to implement this uh, directly. This should be possible, especially considering the fact if uh, the succession includes an acceptance on the part of the creditor to this kind of an activity or transaction to be carried out. Institutions exist which work particularly with the succession, matters of successions, and if they carry out verifications, only if the law provides so. This principle works in case if the Lex Reicite lays, uh, provides for it. In other cases, no additional documents can be requested. Having heard the Persons involved in the succession and uh, in accordance with uh, Article 68, Paragraph 4, the official announcement request is announced, is, is performed, I'm sorry. The Ausstellungsbehörde is gehalten, alle erforderlichen Schritte zu unternehmen. And uh, the authority which uh, issues uh, the certificate must take all steps in order to inform the persons who are entitled to the succession that uh, they uh, have uh, uh, the right to a claim, to make their claims for it. I am going to speak slightly slower in order for the interpreters to be able to interpret me perfectly. The institutions which uh, issue the certificate are the institutions which announce the succession as open and they have to give the opportunity for all of the successors and inheritors to present their claims and, and for them to express their wishes. Problems may occur regarding the way how the opening of the succession uh, should be announced. It isn't entirely clear what shape it, to, it should take place, so which uh, member state or member states it should take place in, uh, which, uh, where it should be notified, which language should be used, uh, whether certain deadlines need to be applied. And all of these matters are determined on the basis of a Lex Rei Fori. In other words, the law of the, uh, of the country which uh, 
works on the case. Now, as for the content, it contains very specific norms, specific provisions, and the issuing authority provides for the use or application of a certain, say, questionnaire. It includes several points or items of information, but I would like to mention only a few. For example, 68N provides that the limitations of the successions in um, of uh, the legacies as well as inheritors have to comply with the dis disposition of will. So in other words, this is the information that is included in. In other words, the information is required only then if uh, the uh, limitations uh, do not arise from the existing legislation. If uh, it is uh, anticipated to execute a will by means of limiting the entitlement of successions, then this should be stated in the certificate of section only in very limited and restricted, concise manner. The if we apply a restrictive interpretation, then we do, should know we shouldn't have any interpretations. Basically, in order to interpret the provisions, one must assume that the issuing authority will assume a very vast amount of duties and uh, I highly doubt whether that was the uh, that was the intention of the legislator one must observe all of the limitations applied to the inheritors successors and uh, unit 68o applies another problem, for example, the limitations with regard to the managers of the, of the succession, which also have to be specified in the certificate of succession. This also doesn't mean that the will has to be carried out. It also requires, as for, from what can be inferred, what legal limitations are applied to the executor of the will of the estate. And one com can infer from that that, that that many problems will ar arise regarding this in practice. It will not be possible to uh, to determine, to specify all of the limitations which the um, executor of the will has to uh, observe in a very concise and short uh, manner. In order to limit uh, the necessary information, it would be very useful if we uh, apply the, the bona fide principle. If the testator requests the execution of the will in, in involving the carrying out of certain preconditions, which is not mentioned in the certificate of, of succession. For example, the will will be executed only if the uh, inheritor acquires a higher education. Then the bona fide protection principle should apply with regard to the execute, executor of the will. And if the succession or will has not been performed yet, then the problem is that no remarks regarding this are specified in the succession of the certificate yet. Thus, uh, the executor of the succession, the authority of whom has already expired with regard to the will of the testator, he is uh, sort of forced to carry on working in bona fide. Uh, pro bono, 
And you see, this is a great interference into the national substantive law, you applying the bona fide principle. And this cannot really be justified. One might ask why such provisions are necessary and who needed them. The point of a a departure for the Commission was that uh, this, the Certificate of Succession will be a vanimekum, a guideline for what do we do next, how do we proceed. And this is where the inheritors might uh, where all of the rights and obligations on the part of the inheritors can be specified. However, it is not possible to achieve this by means of the certificate of succession. Nevertheless, I am actually trying to illustrate what problems you will encounter when applying the regulation regarding the certificate of succession. Also, the aspiration of the commission has led to the fact that even in simple, non-complicated matters of successions, it can be so that uh, the certificate of succession can be some 20 pages, even if there is just one testator and one inheritor involved. Now, as for the effects uh, that uh, the certificates of succession are going to have. Now, as for the assumption effect, Article 69 specifies that the certificate of succession specifies the facts from which the handing over of the rights to succession are transferred in the event of death. So it is assumed that all of the information and all of the facts are truthful without any gaps or shortages. It isn't the situation when erroneous or untruthful certificates of succession are executed is not precluded or prevented. Thus, this assumption effect or the assumption principle evolves that everything is executed correctly and truthfully. This assumption effect is also problematic in the sense that, for example, in the case of uh, matrimony and matrimonial property regimes, it is assumed that the information uh, specified is truthful and not erroneous. And thus, this means that uh, the certificate of succession would also apply to matters and questions which are more far-reaching than the area of applicability of this regulation. And I think that we will have to wait for more for the application of new legislation at the EU level. Article 69 also assumes that persons specified as inheritors also are entitled to the rights that are identified in the succession of law and the and only these particular rights and limitations that are mentioned in the certificate are transferred to the inheritor in question. Thus, once again, we see that another problem evolves, namely data specified regarding rights and limitations with regard to the testators and inheritors has not disappeared anywhere. If the information is exhaustive and uh, wide-ranging, then it will be inevitable that the actual legal status 
is reflected incompletely. This will happen whether we like it or not. If Conversely, this information is, wide, is so widely scoped and extensive, then the translation costs will be quite large and also inevitable. And I think that the resolution regarding this matter is well, basically lies in your hands. Now, as for the bona fide effect, the, the Article 69, Paragraph 3, defines that any any persons uh, that uh, carry out payments or transfer property to the person which is identified in the certificate of a succession authorized to accept a payment has carried out a, a transaction with a person which is authorized, this, uh, except for the cases when they, then they are aware of the fact that the, the content is untruthful, or in cases of gross negligence. I think that uh, the protection is um, specified only very narrowly. This is uh, only related to the transfer of rights to one particular person. However, other, say, obligations or debts which have to be covered or performed with regard to the succession are not included. Why is this bona fide effect so stringently limited, why only certain, certain beneficiaries of certain payments are, are specified here. I don't really understand. The draft of the commission had initially anticipated or planned for limiting the bona fide principle even to a larger extent, especially with regard to persons when, when no information exists with regard to, to the existence of, of, of the truthfulness of the information. Article 69, paragraph 3, lays down protective measures for persons which provide services, whereas uh, paragraph 4 lays down protective measures for the persons that receive them, in other words, the recipients of these services. And the bona fide recipient is perceived to be as a person which uh, enjoys full succession rights. However, the protection of this right cannot be enjoyed if uh, the person was aware of the fact that this information was untruthful. Now, that so much for the, the effect of the certificate of uh, succession. Now, I would like to talk about the official register. In accordance with Article 69, Paragraph 5, a certificate is a valid, valid document in order to register the succession in the corresponding register. Of the, mem of the corresponding member state. However, what are the relations? So what is the relationship be between the uh, certificate of succession and the Lex Re Sitte? According to the reform mentioned, this is a the, this is determined in the scope, and here one must refer to the article which states that the scope of the regulation does not include rights in REM as well as uh, the registration of movable and immovable pro uh, property, as well as the requirements uh, for registration of uh, the, this property. Now, viewing this uh, in the context of the recital number 18, one must conclude the following. On the one hand, 
We have to consider the numerous clauses of specified in the national law, whereas on the other hand, the European certificate succession does not replace the national the the requirement to observe national norms as far as it is related to the registration of uh, property in the register of uh, in the register in question. I'm not going to go in greater greater detail with this matter. And you know, I have a purely German perspective of the matter. However, it might become topical if we look at uh, the numerous clauses of uh, the rights and rems code. Mr. Verko mentioned in his presentation that uh, he anticipates the fact that apart from the European certificate of successions, there may be cases when one must verify the, the enforceability of the certificate of successions issued in another member state, but this is not so clear cut. We will have to see what the, the position of the commission is. Apparently, we have the case of a clear con conscience in this case, and I'm not going to greater, go into greater detail. Two remarks regarding the scope or enforceability of the certificate of succession. The certificate of succession does not uh, apply to the transfer of the part of a succession which arises from the Article 63, which lays down this uh, limitation uh, element. This uh, is a legal transaction that is uh, of a decisive importance in this regard. Thus, uh, apparently, we have to conclude that shares of a succession cannot be transferred by means of certificates of succession, and the same uh, observations or grounds are uh, related to disputes regarding uh, successions, which uh, take place on the basis of uh, legal transactions. And accordingly, nothing of uh, this sort can be specified in the certificate of succession. <coughs> now speaking about certificate copies of uh, these uh, certificates of succession, the regulation uh, lays down only six words for this certified copy. Uh, this certificate copy, uh, sh copy should include um, a limi limitation date or end date, only in some cases a longer term than six months can be applied. The validity of such um, instrument, uh, this is provided for to protect uh, these uh, matters in cases uh, when the documents turn out to be false. Uh, that's why the, uh, the harm might be limited. That's why by limiting uh, the um, validity of uh, certificates of successions, uh, we uh, can sometimes protect uh, both sides. But we have to ask ourselves a question whether this uh, um, verification or authenticated, uh, authenticated copy of such false certificate is valid or can be considered valid. But before asking ourselves this question, I have to say that in practice, in legal practice, this term of six months for certified copies might be a very, very short time, especially in some cases. 
wird es oft nicht ausreichend und nicht zufriedenstellend sein. Wenn um, weiß, in more in complicated cases, of course, it's uh, too short, but also for heirs, I believe it might be too short, especially when a certificate of succession um, comes from abroad and in some month uh, it's no longer valid. Uh, so I think it should be valid for a longer uh, term. So in um, Article 17, Paragraph 3, uh, provides for a longer uh, validity as an excep exception of such certificate, certified copies or certificates, but if it's not provided for, owners or holders of such certified copies could ask an issuing authority to prolong the term of validity of certified copies. And if a certified copy is not yet obtained, uh, it can be uh, demanded from an authority. Now, uh, the question remains whether um, an heir asking for prolongation of validity of a certified copy should also ask for a new uh, should, uh, should ask for this certified copy as a new document. And if nothing has changed, uh, there are no grounds for a new document. Um, it's just the, the term or, or the validity that should, in a form of a stamp or a signature, uh, pro be prolonged on the same document. And now the conclusion. Speaking about the Certificate of Succession of Europe, there are some questions that remain unanswered. Um, so the first question is, um, how popular will become this uh, new international instrument? It will be, uh, it will directly depend on national implementation and how the implementing countries will answer the problematic questions that were touched upon in my speech. So uh, this uh, certificate of succession of Europe will uh, challenge you to the utmost. So be prepared and thank you for your attention. Thank you.